Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. This week, we're joined by University of California law professor Joel Richard Paul for a conversation about his latest book, Indivisible, Daniel Webster and the Birth of American Nationalism. Daniel Webster was the best-known orator in antebellum America. His speeches were widely shared, inspiring many Americans, including Abraham Lincoln, to see the country as one nation, bound together by the U.S. Constitution, rather than as a collection of individual states with unique interests. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. Joel Richard Paul, your new book is titled Indivisible, Daniel Webster and the Birth of American Nationalism. Tell me the story that you tell your readers. Well, you know, at the start of our republic, we really didn't have an idea of what it meant to be an American. Um, uh, Krev Kerr famously wrote, uh, what, is, what, what is an American then? Uh, because at the start of our republic, really, people were Virginians, they were New Yorkers, they didn't really have a sense of what America meant. America was really just a concept. It was, a, it was an idea, but it wasn't a reality for most people who lived just a few miles from the place where they were born, um, and they never really ventured much into other states. So we have these competing ideas of nationalism that arose in the early part of our republic, say between the years of 1812 and 1800 and 1840. And during that period of time, um, there were various notions of what it meant to be an American. Uh, uh, Henry Clay had this notion that uh, um, we would create infrastructure and the infrastructure would knit the country together and that would create a sense of American nationality. Um, uh, John Quincy Adams thought that it was the territory of the United States that actually defined us as Americans. Um, and you had John C. Calhoun who really questioned the idea of America as one country and saw the country instead as really just a confederacy of states in which any one of the states was free to nullify federal law and secede from the union at will. And then you have uh, Andrew Jackson, who comes to office with ideas about American nationality as defined by our race. He believed that basically uh, to be an American, you had to be a white European and that African-Americans and indigenous peoples and Mexicans were all excluded from American nationality. And against these competing ideas of nationalism, Daniel Webster sort of pushes the idea that our nationality is defined for us by the Constitution, that the Constitution is the organic expression of the will of the American people. And the Constitution made us all Americans, regardless of our race, our religion, our faith, what part of the country we live in. And the book is basically the story of how he did that. Daniel Webster is uh, in the subtitle, but should readers expect a full-on biography of Daniel Webster in your pages? No, this is definitely not a full-on biography of Daniel Webster. It's, uh, I hope, a much richer history of the whole period from about 1812 to 1852, during which time this notion of American nationalism began to crystallize. Today, nationalism can be a toxic concept. Oh, how do you feel about that as someone's exploring the roots of American nationalism? Well, it's precisely because of the toxicity of American nationalism today, the way that we talk about nationalism today as this being a white Christian nation, uh, so deeply offensive to the reality of who we are as a people. And I wanted to explore the history of how our ideas of nationalism were formed to remind people that in fact, we are a country of, of uh, immigrants, we're a polyglot nation. Um, and that is what makes us unique and what makes us strong. And, and so I, I hope that my book will, will give people a sense that it is the constitution that made all of us Americans, regardless of where we came from. What adjectives best describe the 50-year period of history covered in your book? Well, it was a very fractious time, as you know. Uh, the country was, on the one hand, falling apart, 
the, the conflict between the free states and the slave states uh, made it very difficult um, to I admit any of the new territory uh, that had been acquired uh, first from the Louisiana Purchase and then subsequently in the Mexican-American War. So it was a fractious time in which there were these competing elements. Um, and at the same time that the country was kind of falling apart, our ideas of what it meant to be an American were coming together. So you wrote an earlier book about the great Chief Justice John Marshall. What, as a historian and biographer, what interests you about this early Republic years? Well, John Marshall and Daniel Webster were closely associated. Um, John Marshall was the fourth Chief Justice of the United States, and he really formed the basic ideas we have about what the Constitution means. The Constitution was a kind of inert document before John Marshall came along. John Marshall read the Constitution not as an inert document, not as something that was dead, but as something which was alive and something which was intended to be a vehicle for helping the country to move forward. And Daniel Webster argued many of the great cases before John Marshall. Uh, and indeed, uh, some of what John Marshall wrote in his opinions was lifted from Daniel Webster's briefs and arguments before the court. And so these two men kind of formed a synergy uh, about building a stronger national government um, based on this principle that the Constitution was not merely a confederation of states, but the Constitution was the organic expression of the will of the American people. So again, as a scholar, what intrigues you personally about this period uh, across a couple hundred years of American history? Well, I, I, I teach a constitutional law at the University of California, and um, the constitutional principles that I teach my students were largely formed during this period of time. Uh, and it's interesting to me because the Constitution is basically about the idea of legitimacy, um, the role of the Supreme Court uh, in forming the Constitution is based on the idea that all of us have some sense that the, the Supreme Court is acting as a legitimate body. Uh, and it was John Marshall who kind of created the idea that the Supreme Court was a co-equal branch of our government and that what the, what the court said, how the court interpreted the Constitution, that was the final word about what the Constitution meant. Um, and so I was interested about how he managed to form something from nothing, how he managed to invent uh, an, an, an institution that today we treasure and that it didn't really have that kind of power before John Marshall became Chief Justice. So since Daniel Webster is the through point of this tumultuous history that you tell in your book, a little bit of, of time about him. So when and where was he born? So Daniel Webster is from New Hampshire. Uh, he was the 10th uh, child of a, a New Hampshire farmer who was uh, had a very modest living. Um, and Daniel Webster was a sort of sickly child. He wasn't very good at working on the farm, but he was, uh, he showed signs of intelligence and his father encouraged that and, um, decided to send his son to Phillips Academy for his education. Um, uh, to do that, his father had to mortgage the farm. Um, he sends his son to Phillips Academy and, uh, a few months into his education there, uh, all of the boys are asked to stand up and to recite. And John Marshall froze. He couldn't stand up and recite. Uh, he simply couldn't speak. And so he was removed from the Phillips Academy. And he, he went home. He was very disgraced. He felt humiliated by that experience. And he was determined to overcome his fear of public speaking. And so he sets out to do that. And um, he, he has a private tutor and he manages to... Uh, develop a capacious memory. Uh, he is able, it's said, to memorize 70 passages of the Bible in a single weekend. 
uh, and he uses his memory a as a way of giving him more confidence in his public speaking. Uh, and then he goes off to Dartmouth College and he's a kind of mediocre student, except that he has this extraordinary ability to speak. And it's his speaking ability that really launches his career. He goes on to become um, an attorney in New Hampshire. Uh, and very early on, he gives a speech against the War of 1812 that is so well received by the audience that they basically decide to send him to Congress. So he sends, he goes to Congress, and um, he is one of the most outspoken opponents of the War of 1812. Um, subsequent to that, he moves to Boston and becomes an attorney there, where there's, uh, uh, you know, more opportunities for a young lawyer. And um, uh, once again, he distinguishes himself by his speaking, his public speaking. He gives a, a famous speech uh, in Plymouth, Massachusetts, where he denounces slavery. Um, and he is swept into office, first as a congressman and later as a senator. Um, and he becomes uh, famous as a Supreme Court advocate. Uh, he's known as the defender of the Constitution. And he's a member of Congress, a senator, uh, and twice Secretary of State, four times he runs for president over the course of 40 years from 1812 to 1852. He really dominates the political scene in American life. But the thing that really distinguished him was this extraordinary capacity for public speaking. Over the course of his public life, he belonged to three different parties, sometimes because the parties went away. But did he have a defining ideology that was consistent through those years? Yeah, I think he did. I mean, his, his defining ideology uh, was uh, his belief in the union uh, and his opposition to slavery. Those were the two dominant themes in his public life. Um, he was known as the conscience of New England, the voice of New England. He was the guy who stood up in Congress and made public speeches uh, in which he was clearly opposed to the slaveocracy. Uh, and um, he personally um, purchased the freedom of various slaves who then joined his household as servants. Um, he uh, tried in various ways through his Supreme Court arguments to try to strengthen the arm of Congress and the federal government so that Congress could eventually act as the vehicle for crushing slavery. And at the same time, uh, he believed strongly in the Union. And he's, he is most famously connected with, with one of his uh, great speeches in which he said, um, liberty and Union uh, now and forever, one and inseparable. And he didn't think that the Union was free today. He thought that he, he knew that a third of our population was enslaved and his view was that the union was the vehicle for ending slavery. That's what his public life was about. So people today, 21st century, might not appreciate the importance of good oratory skills, good speaking skills. I have a clip from a former Senate historian, now historian emeritus, Don Ritchie, from a program C-SPAN did on the Capitol about Webster and his speaking skills. It's brief. Let's watch. People used to line up at dawn to get into the Senate chamber to hear Daniel Webster speak. He had this eloquent manner about him, and everybody felt, even if it wasn't the greatest speech they'd ever heard, they could tell their children and their grandchildren that they heard the great Daniel Webster speak at one time. He could speak for days on an issue, but they somehow were able to uh, get to the nub of what the issue was. And we remember him today, not for the length of the speeches, but for uh, certain telling phrases. I speak today not as a Northern man, not as a Massachusetts man, but as an American. Joel Richard Paul, uh, the importance of oratory in 19th century America, what role did it play? Well, we had no social media. We had no television. Um, uh, people made attending public speeches a kind of public outing. Um, families would go, they would bring picnic lunches. They would sit for hours in the hot sun or in the cold or the rain to listen to these famous orators. And among all of them, the most famous was Daniel Webster. 
um, Daniel Webster would give a speech. It could go four or five hours long. And people were absolutely riveted by his words. Um, uh, probably the most famous incident ever counted in the book uh, involved the dedication of the monument at Bunker Hill. Daniel Webster um, uh, was speaking at an occasion when Lafayette, Mar the Marquis de Lafayette, who had been the great general during the American Revolution, came back to the United States to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill. And an audience of 40,000 Bostonians were gathered on this hillside um, to hear Daniel Webster speak at this dedication. And they had erected um, special seating for the, for the ladies. And over their overhead, they had a tent to uh, a canopy to protect them from the hot sun. And as Daniel Webster got up to speak, the crowd was so excited that people pushed forward and they knocked down the seating and there was huge tumult and the, the tent fell down on top of these women and women were lying flat on the ground and people were injured and running around screaming. And it was total bedlam. And the marshal said to Daniel Webster, well, you know, uh, it's impossible now to resume the ceremony. And Webster said, nothing is impossible. And he turned to the crowd and he said, somehow in this stentorian voice that he had, uh, be silent. And the crowd instantly stopped, they sat down, they cleared away the tent, people resumed, their, returned to their seats, and his speech continued. And it was because of the, the powerful presence of this man, his enormously loud voice that was often compared to a church organ, um, and the brilliance of his words. And people would describe the experience of being in one of Webster's magnificent speeches as a kind of transformative experience. They felt absolutely mesmerized. People would sort of stagger out of the room after four hours of listening to this man. And there were, there were people in the audience who would transcribe all of his words and then republish them in all the newspapers around the country. Um, uh, his speeches sometimes would get republished in pamphlets as well. Some of his speeches run 60 or 70 published page, pages. I have read them. <laughs> they are very long. But they, the, the, the command of the English language was exceptional. His speeches read like Shakespeare. Um, even in Europe, he was recognized as the greatest orator of his day. Um, uh, Louis Philippe in France invited him to come uh, dine with the King of France and had a giant portrait of uh, Webster addressing the Senate painted, um, uh, which now hangs in Fanwell Hall in Boston. And um, when he went to London on vacation, uh, he was mobbed by all of the great political figures, royalty, um, uh, writers of the day all of whom acknowledged him as the greatest orator of his day. So his, his command of language was so exceptional that even people who never got the opportunity to hear him speak in person were quite familiar with what he said. So the two last questions about uh, Daniel Webster. First of all, uh, throughout the book, we learn that he is a difficult hero and had a number of vices. What were those vices? Well, um, he was overly fond of, uh, of wine, women, and money. Um, and uh, uh, late in his life, he became a drunk. Um, he had a number of affairs. Um, and uh, he was the subject of a lot of scandalous rumor, not, not all of which was true. Um, uh, and he also um, took a fair amount of money from his um, constituents um, uh, because he had he lived wildly extravagant lifestyle he had a huge farm in Marshfield Massachusetts and he didn't really uh, he, he, there was no limit to his appetites so um, he would ask his constituents to give him money to support his lifestyle and some of those constituents had business before the government they wanted protective tariffs for their businesses 
and uh, Webster did their bidding. This was not as unusual as it might sound today. Um, uh, Henry Clay also took a lot of money from various constituents and did their bidding. Um, but it certainly um, made him a more complex hero from his story. You mentioned that he's, he hungered for the presidency, tried four different times. Why did it elude him? Webster was known as Godlike Dan or Godlike Daniel uh, because of this exceptional voice he had that some people described as, you know, listening to the voice of God. And uh, though he was not godly in his personal life, um, he was sort of aloof. Uh, he was remote. He, he was uh, sometimes compared to a statue. Uh, he was a figure of, of great respect, but not a lot of affection. Um, and he he did not he did not deign to uh, you know, slap people on the back or be friendly. He didn't suffer fools gladly. He made known his opinions. He was controversial in the South because of his opposition uh, uh, to slavery. Um, he uh, tried to run for president with support from the North and from the West, but the West had. Henry Clay and Andrew Jackson and later William Henry Harrison and Zachary Taylor, all of whom were heroes in Western states. So he never really made it. Um, but he had an extraordinary career as Secretary of State and as a senator. Um, and uh, his words were so important that excerpts of his speeches were included in the readers that every school child in America read. So everywhere in America, um, there were something like 50 million copies of McGuffey's Reader um, available by 1850 uh, in a population of, um, I forget what the number was, but significantly less than 50 million people. So everybody who had an education, everyone who could read, had read these readers. And they were required to stand up in school and recite excerpts of Webster's speeches extolling the virtue of our union. And it was that that really indoctrinated people in the ideas of nationalism that Webster represented. And that was the same generation that went on to fight in the Civil War. People like Abraham Lincoln were transformed by Webster's words. How do we know that? Well, we know that Lincoln, in Lincoln's case, uh, talked about the fact that Webster was his role model as a, as a speaker. Um, and when Lincoln had his one freshman term in Congress, he, uh, uh, he was very excited to be invited to have, um, to join the sort of breakfast club that Webster had in his home on, on Saturday mornings. And uh, uh, he sort of became a kind of protege of Webster. Um, they were, were, were quite close, um, at least in the sense that Lincoln admired Webster. From Webster's point of view, Lincoln was nobody. Um, Webster vastly overshadowed Lincoln. But we know in Lincoln's speeches that he lifted portions of Webster's speeches. And some of the most famous lines we associate with Abraham Lincoln were so well known as coming from Webster that Lincoln didn't even have to attribute them to Lincoln. So when Webs, when, when uh, I'm sorry, Lincoln didn't have to attribute them to Webster. When Lincoln stands up and says that we're a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, no one in the audience has to be told that, that, that those are Webster's words because everybody knows that from the readers that they read in school. Uh, and so... Webster's influence was quite broad and uh, I think significant in preparing the country for um, the Civil War. After five non-consecutive terms in the U.S. House and it is in between his return to Boston, Daniel Webster was elected to the Senate in 1827, joined what became known as the great triumvirate, triumvirate of Webster, Clay, and Calhoun. Um, I have another clip, and this will be the, the only other one we show in the program. This is Senate historian Betty Coed on that period of time often referred to as the golden age of the Senate. Let's hear what she has to say about that. <laughs> 
The historians have often referred to the 1820 to 1850, roughly, time period as the golden age of the Senate. I tend to reject that label for a variety of reasons. Um, first of all, I can guarantee you that Dan Webster or Henry Clay didn't walk around the Capitol saying, gee, I'm living in the golden age of the Senate. They didn't see it that way. They saw it as a noisy, dirty, cumbersome, difficult, contentious environment where they were trying to get their goals accomplished and their bills passed. So it, it wasn't that different from what we have today. So in that way, it's not necessarily so golden. It was certainly a golden era of political oratory. I mean, these people, Webster, Clay, Calhoun, Thomas Hart Benton, Charles Sumner, the people of this era were monumentally talented speech givers. You know, Daniel Webster was famous for giving five hour after dinner speeches and mesmerized his audiences. That's hard to imagine today. Joel Richard Paul on the golden age of the Senate. What do you think of her reaction? I absolutely agree. Uh, it, you know, it, it, uh, it's, I think it's always true um, as a historian that uh, the age in which we're living in always feels like the most difficult time. Um, and um, the toxicity that we have experienced in our public life recently, uh, while it is very troubling, um, is by no means unprecedented. Um, things were, you know, extremely, extremely violent uh, and, and um, a difficult for members of Congress then. We have to remember that Charles Sumner was caned. Uh, he was almost beaten to death on the floor of the Senate. Um, uh, men threatened each other with guns uh, in the House of Representatives. And so you had tremendously passionate, polemical um, uh, speeches given by these people um, and, and, and tremendous divisions, mostly over the issue of slavery, um, but also the issue of the tariff and building infrastructure for the nation. Uh, these men were by no means gods, but they did have um, monumental capacities for public speaking that uh, just outclass anything we have today. We have a little bit more than 30 minutes left in our hour-long conversation with you, and uh, I want to move into some of these big, big issues that were roiling the, the country and the Congress at that time. Um, and let me start with expansionism, because during these 40 years, uh, huge debates about the extension of America from coast to coast involving Florida, Texas, uh, the Oregon Territory, California, and, and beginning with Missouri in 1820. Would you describe uh, Webster's view? Let's, let's stay with him as the through point. Was he in favor of expansionism? Because this was really a debate about slavery. Right, right. Uh, it, 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 was, it was not initially a debate about slavery. So, so um, the first great expansionist in our, in our history was really John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams was the guy who said, you know, we ought to be a, a republic from, from ocean to ocean. He was the guy who envisioned that, uh, that eventually we would take the frontier all the way to the coast of California. Um, and, and that wasn't about acquiring land for slavery. That was about uh, his idea that the territory defined us as a nation and that somehow, you know, it was sort of divinely uh, intended for us to occupy this whole continent, regardless of the people who are already there that we were pushing out of the way. Um, and and we shouldn't forget that when we talk about expansionism, we're not just talking about slavery, we're also talking about the removal of the indigenous tribes. And, and so um, Webster believed that we had plenty of land uh, with the original 13 colonies or with uh, by Webster's day, the 24 states that we had, we didn't need anything more than that. Webster was in opposition to the Mexican American War as he was in opposition to the War of 1812, which was also intended to annex Canada. That was the purposes of the War of 1812. Um, as we expanded the territory, of course, the issue was, were we going to have free states or slave states uh, added to the Union? When there were 24 states, there were 12 free states and 12 slave states. 
In the House of Representatives, the free states always had the majority because there were larger populations there. But as we opened up the West, the population in the Northeast began moving westward because the land in the Northeast was less fertile than the land was out West. There were more opportunities for people out West. There was more land to acquire. And so the population in the Northeast began to shrink. Uh, The population in the West began to grow. Um, This was of concern also to Webster and other Northeastern politicians. They didn't want to lose, lose their populations. With 12 free states and 12 slave states in the Senate, you had some equilibrium between free and slaveocracy. But but once you started talking about acquiring states like Missouri, that would have meant that the slave states would have a majority. And so we had to add Maine at that point. And so there was this there was this tit for tat, this negotiation that would take place to try to keep the balance in the Senate maintained. The truth is the slaveocracy uh, had dominated American government from the very beginning. You know, if, if you think about it, uh, uh, of the American presidents before Lincoln, everyone except um, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, uh, Millard Fillmore, uh, Mill- Millard uh, F- uh, Fillmore and um, uh, James Buchanan were slaveholders. All the other presidents were slaveholders. And Millard Fillmore and James Buchanan were sympathetic to the slaveholders. So really only the Adams had stood alone in opposing slavery before Lincoln. Uh, And of the Supreme Court justices, two thirds of them were slaveholders. And some of the, most of the rest were also sympathetic to the slaveholders. So the South had dominated the government. And it was really only in the Senate where this issue kind of, uh, began to crystallize about the balance between free and slave states. Why was the debate over tariffs, uh, which not only encompassed the 40 years you write about, but really dominated much of the 19th century in American politics, why was, uh, what role did it have in the creation of American nationalism or the delay in that that concept? Yeah, that's a great question. but we don't normally think about the United States this way. Um, but um, uh, John Rutledge, who was uh, an early justice in the Supreme Court, once said <clears throat> that when we formed the union, when we formed the Constitution, uh, we came together to create a customs union and we created a nation by accident. Uh, and, and what we really did in the Constitution, what we purported to do in the Constitution was to eliminate barriers to trade among uh, the states, which had created up to that point in time, uh, enormous dislocations, economic dislocations, and inconsistent tariff policies towards other countries. Uh, so tariff policy was always a hot issue in American government. Early on, of course, um, uh, people like Alexander Hamilton argued for having a protectionist tariff to protect the growth of infant industries in the United States. Um, and that debate continued into Webster's time and into the uh, right up to the, the Civil War. For the South, which was primarily uh, an exporter of rural products, uh, for them, um, they didn't want to have any kind of protectionist tariffs because it would raise the cost of the manufactured products that they imported from Europe or, or that we they bought from the North. But for Northern industries, they needed a protectionist tariff to enable them to compete with uh, textile mills in Britain that were much more, uh, much larger and, and, and much better established. And so the argument about tariffs uh, 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 engaged both the North and the South as opponents, as well as the slave issue. And then you have the West, where Henry Clay um, made the argument uh, there should be a sort of grand bargain between the North and the West, where the West would favor high tariffs 
to create additional revenues for the federal government that could then be expended to build out the infrastructure that would open up the West and create more opportunities for Westerners. And so these three regions of the country uh, competed intensely over the question of tariff policy. And related to that, uh, an ongoing debate and got very, very challenging was the battle over the creation of a national bank, which Andrew Jackson was heavily involved in. Uh, why was this such a contentious issue? Yeah, well, this this is difficult to explain in a short um, snip, but uh, I'll try to do my best. Um, uh, essentially, what you had at the um, early in the early part of the of the republic, really up until the Civil War, what you had was um, every state had state banks, and the state banks issued their own banknotes, which operated like currency. So, if you banked at uh, Wells Fargo, you got some Wells Fargo notes, and if you banked at Bank of America, you got Bank of America notes, and there was no equivalency. So. It wasn't like a dollar from one bank was worth a dollar at another bank. And this created all sorts of economic dislocations, uh, trying to figure out um, what something was worth. If you if you tried to use your money in from a South Carolina bank to buy goods from Massachusetts, how would a Massachusetts bank value those South Carolinian notes? And to become a bank in those days, all you needed was a printing press. You, you didn't need, there was no real bank regulation. Um, and so you had a lot of fly-by-night operations, people just printing money that was essentially worthless and inflationary. Um, and uh, the idea of a national bank was to create one currency um, that could push the other state bank's currency out of circulation and that the national bank uh, would create some kind of stability uh, in the value of currency. That was part of the argument for the National Bank. The hostility to the National Bank arose because, first of all, um, many Republicans, um, uh, that is to say, these are Jeffersonian Republicans, not Lincoln Republicans, uh, or Democrats, Andrew Jackson Democrats, um, they opposed the national banks, because the national bank threatened to create a stronger national government, and they they favored states' rights over the national government. Um, they also didn't like the idea of big corporations. The national bank, the second national bank of the United States, was the largest corporation in the world in its day. It had thirty five million dollars of capital, which at the time was you know a, a staggering sum of money, um, about uh, what Jeff Bezos earns in a, about five minutes. But the $35 million was, was a, um, made it a giant, and, it, and, it, and it, people didn't like the idea of that kind of economic power. But also, it meant that the states would lose their control over their state banks, and they didn't want the competition for their state banks. And so for all of these reasons, there was just this enormous hostility aimed at the national bank. And on top of all of that, uh, was the fact that the National Bank, for a variety of reasons, began foreclosing on a lot of farms um, and a lot of land back in the West, and that made them even less popular. Um, so Jackson, who had no understanding of economics at all, and who was just kind of inherently hostile to bankers and finance people and commerce generally and, and Northeast urbanites, um, he was just determined to crush the National Bank, and that became one of the centerpieces of his administration. Uh, knowing that our time is short and this history is rich and deep, uh, 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 throughout this entire period, as you said earlier, the risk of, of uh, separation by regions of the country was was very real. Early on, the, the New England states had almost voted to succeed. Uh, during this period of time, of course, the South, always on the verge of secession. One of the big crises occurred uh, during at 1832 with the nullification crisis. I wanted to get that on the record because, back to Daniel Webster, it was the causation of his most famous speech, the second reply to Haynes. Can you set the stage for us? Sure. 
So uh, basically, South Carolina um, and Georgia both had problems with the national government. Um, in Georgia's case, it was they wanted to get the Native American tribes pushed out of Georgia, out of Georgia's territory, so that that could be that could be land for white people. Um, in South Carolina's case, it was opposition to the tariffs uh, because um, Southerners felt that it was it disfavored agricultural exports. Uh, and it drove up the cost to uh, South Carolinians. So South Carolina, um, uh, represented by John C. Calhoun, uh, writes this diatribe where he says that the states have the power to nullify federal law, including the tariff, and that if um, if the federal government doesn't like it, um, South Carolina has the right to secede. Uh, and uh, at the time, John C. Calhoun is the vice president of the United States under Andrew Jackson. And so he's sitting in the presiding chair in the Senate. Um, and Senator Hain uh, was Southern, was a senator from South Carolina who gave um, a speech in which he accused the North of seeking to impoverish the South. Daniel Webster uh, gets up and gives a reply to Senator Hayne. There's actually two replies, but the second reply is the one that is the most famous response. Um, and he gets up and, and basically um, he, he uses uh, his attack, his response to Senator Hayne to get Senator Hayne to make the argument that, that John C. Calhoun has made in favor of nullification and secession. And then... Webster gets up and gives this incredibly powerful oration um, where he famously says, liberty and union now and forever, one and inseparable. And, and the, and it's, um, uh, it is the, it's the speech that really more than any sort of made history for, for Webster uh, because um, it's this just very powerful defense of the idea of, of union and the and and a, a kind of um, a, a reflection on the importance of our history, um, uh, the the promise that our constitution represented, uh, and the notion that the union itself um, uh, is what makes us free and keeps us free. So with the 15 minutes left, I want to fast forward to the closing act for the Great Triumvirate, which was the Compromise of 1850. You describe a very dramatic scene. Monday, January 21st, 1850, Henry Clay knocks on Webster's door late at night. What was he seeking? Well, what was happening in 1850, of course, was um, that California wanted to be admitted to the Union. Now, in 1849, everyone knows they discovered gold in California. And it was important to admit California to the Union for just that reason, because Spain, Russia, Britain, France, everybody wanted gold. Uh, so we, we had to take California. But California would enter as a free state, and that would upset the balance again between the free states and the slave states. And so the slave states threatened to secede from the Union if California is admitted as a free state. And Clay, who is at this point uh, very old and very sickly, and is about to, to die in a few years, uh, Clay comes to Webster's door in the middle of a snowstorm and says, you know, I've got this idea for a compromise. And he lays out this very complicated compromise, but the but the two critical parts of the compromise are that in exchange for the South agreeing to allow California to enter the Union as a free state, the North will agree to enforce the fugitive slave laws, which had never been enforced. Now, the fugitive slave law was based on the Constitution, which requires the states to return any fugitive slaves. But the North courts and the Northern juries would never allow that to happen. So as the Underground Railroad was, was, was uh, uh, becoming more successful in getting thousands of African Americans who enslaved in the South free and brought to the North and ultimately to Canada, 
um, Southern slaveholders wanted to, to do something about this. Uh, and so that's what Clay is proposing to do, to, to create a system whereby federal magistrates would be appointed, not allowing state judges and state courts and state juries, but a federal magistrate who could simply give an order with no due process at all that a specific uh, African-American would be sent back to enslavement in the South. Uh, and in order for this compromise to secede, Clay has to get the cooperation of Webster because Webster, as the leading voice of New England, as the guy who has made a career of opposing slavery, he's the guy who can persuade the other Northerners to go along. And for Webster, this is this is a, a real conflict. He has to decide between his loyalty to the Union on the one hand and his loyalty to the anti-slavery cause on the other. And he knows that it's a career ender because he knows that if he endorses the fugitive slave laws, the Massachusetts legislature is never going to send him back to the Senate and his career is finished in politics. But he decides that it's more important to hold on to the Union as the vehicle for ending slavery. And he gives this speech on March 7th, 1850, on the floor of the Senate, where he basically uh, says, you know, the union is more important and and we have to agree to enforce the future slave laws. And on that basis, enough Northern congressmen and senators agree that the law is passed and the union is saved for at least 10 years. The, but, ne- the next step in his but, in his in his career was one that I just didn't understand because then he resigned to become Secretary of State and in that position was responsible for enforcing the Fugitive Slave Law, a, a law that he had to swallow hard to accept. Why would he have done that? Well, the problem that Webster faced was uh, he needed a graceful way to get out of the Senate. Um, he had served as Secretary of State previously, um, and uh, he had distinguished himself greatly in that role. Uh, he was the guy who basically defined the borders between the United States and Canada. And so he, he, he agrees to take this as a way to kind of get out of elective politics uh, and join the administration. And maybe he thinks that his time as Secretary of State will somehow redeem him. But the Secretary of State's job in those days wasn't dealing with foreign governments alone. The Secretary of State was more like a prime minister. He ran the whole government except for the War Department and the Treasury Department. And in that capacity, he was what we now regard as the Attorney General. He was the guy who ran all of the district attorneys, all the enforcement of law all over the country. That was Webster's responsibility. And so when a fugitive slave um, is arrested in Boston uh, and goes taken before a federal magistrate, a mob forms that frees this man from captivity and he escapes to Canada. And Webster felt that it was personally embarrassing to him and to the administration it looked as if they had entered into the 1850 compromise in bad faith. And so in order to show his good faith and his intention to to really honor the compromise that held the union together, he undertakes the job of enforcing the future slave laws personally. Which you say he still aspired to the presidency one last time. This doomed his chances? Yes. Well, I mean, I I think, you know, this is um, a little bit like a a former president seeking the uh, office again. Um, uh, Webster is uh, is a guy who isn't really, he's not a viable candidate. He couldn't even get endorsed by his own state as, as, as a candidate. He couldn't even get nominated as a candidate. But, you know, in his deluded thinking, he thought that, well, maybe there's some way I could win over Southern support or Western support or something. It was it was a fantasy. It was not a reality for Webster at all. And, you know, he he was drinking very heavily at the time. And he 
uh, is a disaster. His secretary of state, he's denounced by all of his friends. Um, you know, uh, most famously, Ralph Waldo Emerson says that the the word uh, liberty in the mouth of Daniel Webster is like the word love in the mouth of a courtesan. And uh, uh, John uh, John Henry Greenleaf, uh, uh, John Greenleaf, a Whittier, writes a, a, po- a poem uh, in which he denounces Webster and says that the man is dead. And, um, uh, you know, Webster had no friends at that point. He was just simply um, a lonely, desperate, man and and he dies two years later as you explained the compromise of 1850 would not have passed without webster's support i wrote down this quote from your book the life of every great figure ends in tragedy but the particular tragedy of webster's life was also america's tragedy what were you thinking well i mean it's the tragedy that um you know there was no solution uh to the conflict between the north and the south and uh we we're headed into the great conflict of the Civil War. Um, what, what Webster did accomplish with the Compromise of 1850, and this point uh, should be made, um, is that in 1850, the country by no means was prepared to fight the Civil War. Uh, if the South had seceded in 1850, uh, you had Millard Fillmore in the role of Abraham Lincoln, and Millard Fillmore was no Abraham Lincoln. He, he was, uh, he was completely out of his depth. Um, And the North was not overwhelmingly anti-slavery at that point either. What happened because of the fugitive slave laws was that Northerners who had previously thought about slavery as kind of an abstraction that had happened remotely someplace else, was suddenly, it was happening in their backyards. They they saw African-Americans in change dragged onto slave ships. And that radicalized the North. Uh, the anti-slavery vote in 1850 was just 10% of the country. Um, but by 1860, you get Abraham Lincoln. And, 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 and that shows how much things had changed. And the other factor was that the North in 1850 uh, was economically and militarily ahead of the South. But the gap grew dramatically over the next 10 years. The North North really had all of the arms industry in the country by 1860. Connecticut was the largest arms manufacturer in the world. And so, and the South had, for whatever reason, closed all of our armories. Um, So the South didn't have the weapons or the ammunition to fight in 1860. The North had everything uh, and, and, I believe that we would not have won the Civil War had it not been for that delay of 10 years. So let's close our conversation with your thesis, which is this is the period when American nationalism began to gel. Uh, Another quote from your book, uh, the period of 1812 to 1852, while the Union was falling apart during this period, American identity was taking shape. Those two thoughts seem counterintuitive. So why don't you close by explaining how both of them could exist simultaneously? Yeah. Well, I think that, uh, you know, um, as I said at the the beginning of our conversation, um, America was an abstraction at the beginning of our republic. Um, by 1850, America was no longer an abstraction. People began to feel they were actually Americans. They began to identify themselves as Americans. At the same time, there was this political division. Culturally, the way in which we identified ourselves was important. When the South seceded in 1860, the Southerners didn't see themselves as leaving the Union or, or, or being less American or, or not being Americans. They thought they were taking with them the true idea of what it meant to be American. They wrote a constitution for the Southern Confederacy that's almost word for word our constitution. They didn't change much in the constitution. They had a government that looked very much like the national government. And it is, it is that fact that made it possible, I think, for the country to come back together again, because we were ultimately saw each other as Americans. 
And I think it has relevance today when there's so much debate and, and toxicity over the question of who is legitimately here in this country and who belongs here. The notion of, a, of white Christian nationalism that we hear so much about today is so completely un-American and contrary to this notion that the Constitution made all of us one nation. And, and that idea, which was, which was fought over and which was won by Daniel Webster in the 1840s, that idea has to remain the centerpiece, I think, of, of American national identity today. Joel Richard Paul's new book, Indivisible, Daniel Webster and the Birth of American Nationalism. Thank you so much for spending an hour with C-SPAN. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast, so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome. 